Welcome back to Faz TV. And coming up on this week's episode, we hear about the Faz Backing Beef Roadshow, which has been providing advice and potential options to ensure beef farmers are in the best position to deal with short term challenges and take advantage of future opportunities. And we hear from SRUC researchers about the studies that have been carried out looking at dairy cow behaviour and welfare. We are living and farming in very interesting times, with inputs inflating quicker than outputs. This winter is likely to be challenging for all beef producers. It has never been more important to take a look at your business and to ensure that you are in the best position to deal with short-term challenges and take advantage of future opportunities. The FAS Backing Beef Roadshow of three meetings across Scotland finished up at Oak Ridge Farm on the 10th of November, with each meeting providing farmers with advice and potential options for this coming winter. We're here today at SRUC Oak Ridge and we're having a backing beef event through the Farm Advisory Service. Today, this is the third in a roadshow. We've had a, a meeting in Castle Douglas and a meeting also uh, in Inverness. And really all we're trying to do today is to show first of all that we are supportive of the of the beef industry and also we are farming and living in very interesting and, and quite challenging times so today we were really we had, we've, uh, we had a series of speakers who were just trying to give farmers hints and tips as to where where they can make small changes to their businesses to basically improve profitability and make sure that we're still here Things are beginning to improve when we look at fertiliser prices and, and in some cases feed prices as well. So we, there are reasons to be positive, but we really need to keep our pencils sharp and keep our, our minds really focused on doing a good job, doing the best job we possibly can for this year. And I truly believe that things will improve and will be better uh, as we proceed into uh, 2023 and beyond. I think there's a very bright future in, in, in the beef sector in Scotland, as long as we focus on low cost systems and high value product. Today I've been talking about the beef trade and cost of production and what producers need to think about for the winter ahead. So what we've seen is prolonged high beef prices above four pounds a kilo now for over 18 months. And whilst this has been good, producers have been challenged with increased fertilizer, food and fuel prices. The last few weeks have seen an increase in the beef price um, in the run up to Christmas as always, and it's expected that in the next couple of weeks that that price will peak and if not come back as the Christmas kills are finished and there's a drive then towards cheaper beef again and the cow trade probably will pick up and demand for prime cattle will come back. This will be a challenge in time for producers as there's probably more prime cattle going to become available in the coming weeks and months. And when we talk about the cull cow price, it's been really strong this year, over four pound a kilo dead weight. Um, and whilst this has been good for producers to get rid of those older and productive cows, um, I would suggest it's a key time to think about what they're replacing them with. Is the cow that they've gotten rid of, is that the best cow for their system? Is there an opportunity to relook at their system and their cow type and their cow size potentially to make, to make the business work better for them? And so what's been driving that cull cow trade is the, is the demand for manufacturing beef. Um, predominantly mints, um, and that doesn't seem to be going away. We've got a cost of living crisis, um, you know, out in the economy. The economy is not looking particularly good at the moment, and, and consumers are looking for the cheapest option that they can get, um, and that tends to be the more manufacturing type cuts. So processors have been killing a lot of cows um, the last couple of months, um, which is a bit of a concern. When we look at January to September this year, we've killed about 7% more cows than January to September last year and July, September and August individually have killed 14% more cows each month compared to last year. And the more worrying fact is that October is a traditionally high cull cow month and we don't have the figures yet for that, but it is anticipated that it'll be even higher. So there's a concern going forward about the number of cows that are being killed and whether these cows are actually getting replaced or not. Um, heifer kills do not look to be dropping considerably, which would suggest that more heifers are actually being killed. So we we'll probably are looking at a reduction in the beef breeding herd going forward over the next few years, um, which is not particularly good. Store cattle values have been at a similar level to last year, 
certain types have, have fared better this year. So forward stores have, been, have maintained a really strong trade the last couple of months, mainly due to the knowledge that the beef price is relatively steady where it is and obviously would lift in the run up to Christmas. And, and feed prices, although they are expensive in a short keep system, you know where you are with them. Some of the lighter cattle and, and some of these weaned calves, there's a bit more of a, a gamble as to where the beef price will be in potentially a year's time and also where the feed, the feed prices will move. And so what we are urging producers to do today is to really understand what the costs of what they do at the moment is and, and whether there's potential to tweak their systems to, to either increase the output those calves are giving them or to reduce their costs um, of their system overall to make their beef enterprises more, more profitable. My take home thoughts for today were knowing your costs, understanding the market that you're producing for and communication with that marketplace, whether it's store or finished, um, to understand what's required and, and when. When feed is so expensive, is making sure that that ration is actually doing the performance that you want it to do. So if, if you're feeding a set ration to do 1.4 kilo a day, make sure it's doing that. So weigh those animals regularly. Um, if they're not performing, investigate why they're not performing. Look at feed access, look at water availability. Um, make sure they're in a low stress environment. Look at health. Um, all these things will impact the performance. And really at the end of the day, whether you're selling store or finished, to a certain extent, weight pays. Um, and so we need the performance out of these high cost feeds um, to justify the use of them. Um, today I was talking about fertiliser markets and how we can make best use of fertiliser within our systems and the, and the soil management and the crop management that goes alongside making best use of nitrogen. Uh, we're in a place where fertiliser is, is very expensive at the moment. So understanding um, our soil fertility through soil analysis and taking account of any organic manures that we, we've got on farm that we can use is really important as a, a means to help us reduce our, the amount of purchased fertiliser. Um, so the, the, the key points from my presentation today were first thing is to get some soil analysis, get done, get up to date results so that you can measure um, what you need to apply to replace the offtakes from your crop but also to uh, build up any uh, soil status on the, on the farm for your phosphate and uh, potash. Secondly would be prioritise where you're putting your nitrogen. So if you have fields that have got a, a subpar pH then prioritise lime there instead of nitrogen but feed those crops with the highest potential um, or where you need to get most from them, such as your, your silage or uh, forage crops. Third thing to do would be using your information from your soil analysis, using your information from the organic manures uh, is to get a nutrient budget done. So really drill down into the detail about what you need to put on for your soil status, what you need to put on for your crop offtake um, and calculate what you are putting on from organic manures and then balance that up with um, a fertiliser, a, a bagged fertiliser from there. Um, but priority would be your pH and, and soil status for your P and K because they'll help you get the best out of your nitrogen. So currently there's funding available from Scottish Government under the Pathway to Sustainable Farming. So um, they will give you some funding to help towards the cost of soil sampling. And this will give you the information to get a nutrient plan put together. So it's, it's really well-timed funding and I would encourage everybody to, to make the most of it at the moment. I've been talking about winter feeding, um, looking at planning ahead and how we can best manage the beef herd over the course of winter to get best efficiencies and ensure performance is maintained while maintaining costs. We know things aren't cheap at the moment, um, but we want to try and keep efficiency as high as possible. I have kind of discussed looking at feed budgeting um, also kind of managing forage analysis, trying to get the best from your forage and looking through um, growing, finishing and suckler cow diets and how we can increase efficiencies as much as possible when we're housing stock. So there's quite a few good resources that we can use, um, especially with feed budgeting. Um, on the FAST website there's um, two guides, one guide that takes you through how to do a feed budget and also one talking through um, carrying out a feed budget for different classes of stock as well and there's also the FAST companion app that's very useful and a nice easy tool um, to help you feed budget and 
predict, you know, if our supply from forage actually meets our demand on farm as well, which is essential, and can avoid any kind of sudden changes that can be costly, costly to the system as well. Um, so yeah, key take home messages are just plan ahead, think about what you've got on farm, feed, to, like, feed for your production system and feed for what you're trying to get from farm and make the most of what you've got. If you are going to do a finishing kind of diet, you know, make sure you're kind of pushing for that finish, get the live weight gains and cut days on farm as much as possible. That can cost you money, um, extra money in the long run also. Over the, the three meetings we've had on this roadshow, we've spoken to about 250 farmers, which has been great. But today at Oatridge, we also had about 20 students with us. And it was really good to see young people, enthusiastic people who are actually the people who've got, I think, the world at their feet. They're, they're heading into the industry at a time when we've got a, a need for food and we've also got a, a labour crisis on the go as well. So these young guys, great to see them engaged and involved in the meeting today. And I, I really wish them all the best for their future in the industry. If you would like to find out more about the Backing Beef events, please visit fars.scot. Today we are visiting the Barony with SRUC researchers to hear about their studies that have been investigating the behaviour and welfare of dairy cows. My name is Dr Holly Ferguson and I am a precision dairying scientist based at SRUC's Dairy Research and Innovation Centre in Dumfries. My background has involved animal health and nutrition, looking at diseases like acidosis and utilising technology for diseases and disorders. A lot of my work at SRUC centres around using animal mounted sensors to look at predictions of diseases, disorders, animal welfare and production. My name is Dr Laura Shearbridge Carter. I am a postdoctoral research at the Dairy Research and Innovation Centre at SRUC in Dumfries. My research background is in applied animal behaviour and welfare and essentially this means that I study animal behaviour and I can use it then to tell us something about the welfare of that animal. The Dairy Sensors Project was an Innovate UK funded project that looked to explore how could we use sensor data from technology that's already on farm used for things like management aspects, so fertility detection, lameness detection and correlate that with manually recorded behavioural information to understand more about the animal's welfare. So we're looking to try and create potentially an automated welfare sensor utilising this information that farmers are already collecting. The project partners for Dairy Sensors included First Milk and Nestle, McQueen's Dairies and University of Strathclyde as well as SRUC. We worked with over 17 farmers that ranged from Scotland down through England into Wales and three different sensor companies and all the sensor companies were a wee bit different. So we looked at utilising pedometers, um, neck mounted sensors and ear mounted sensors and any of the farmers could take part as long as they either had technology on their farm or were willing to get technology on their farm as part of the project. In this project we used qualitative behaviour assessment which is also known as QBA. When out on farm, the researchers spend some time with the cows to allow them to get used to their presence before starting any behavioural observations. A cow is picked at random and observed for five minutes, after which her behaviour is scored against 20 different QBA terms, including terms like happy, bored and active. Each QBA term is scored on a minimum to maximum scale, with the researcher marking where they felt the observed cow's behaviour fell, giving an individual score for each QBA term for that cow. On each farm, this was repeated for 20 cows at pasture and during the housed period, which can take four hours or more per location. So QBA is a validated form of um, welfare assessment. And so it's been validated to look at pasture quality, clinical mastitis and stockmanship on farm. As well as being validated in terms of measuring different aspects of cow welfare, QBA has also been used to measure the welfare in a range of different animal species by observers with varying degrees of knowledge with good accuracy and reliability. QBA has also been associated with things like pasture quality on farm, with poor QBA scores reflecting lower quality pasture, as well as compromised animal health, body condition scores and even stock person attitudes and behaviour. When we go out on farm and look at the animal, we're not just looking at what she's doing, but we're looking at how she's doing it. 
So for example, if we're watching a cow and she's swishing her tail, we're looking at whether she's just swishing it calmly to get rid of flies, or is she really agitated? Is she kind of staring at us? Does, um, does she look frustrated? So we look at a range of different behaviors. We had both positive and negative behaviors, so things like happy, content, calm and relaxed, but also agitated, frustrated and bored. We wanted to consider the consumer aspect and focus on the presence of positive welfare indicators. And we wanted to be able to automate this so that they, we could remove any bias um, so that we could show that we have happy cows on UK dairy farms. Just because there is a lack of negative welfare indicators on your farm doesn't necessarily mean that you have positive welfare on farm or that indeed you have happy cows. When we looked at the QBE data from indoor animals and pasture-based animals, we found that animals indoor tended to show about 61% of negative behaviours versus animals outdoors who showed about 68% positive behaviours. So the negative behaviours included things like frustrated or bored, apathetic, and positive behaviours like lively, sociable and happy. The QBA data also showed that animals indoors showed a wider range of behaviours than the animals at pasture. So when animals were at pasture, as well as seeing more of the positive behaviours, we saw a smaller range of behaviours. So there was more animals doing more of the same behaviour at the same time and scoring high for these high positive behaviours together. So one of the outputs from this QBA analysis is this PC1 score and this essentially scores our behaviours from positive to negative and what we found was that we had higher and a more narrow range of PC1 scores at pasture compared to indoors. So this suggests that that wider PC1 score indoors shows that cows are more behaviourally constrained and they can't all express positive behaviours at the same time. Synchronous behaviour is a validated form of positive welfare. So essentially, if all of your animals are doing the same thing at the same time, it can be a form of positive welfare and a form of measuring this on farm. One of the aims of the project as a feasibility study was to find patterns in the sensor data that might relate to higher or lower QBA scores, ultimately exploring whether indicators of welfare, and in particular positive welfare, could be measured automatically on farm through sensor data. So we explored different types of sensor data. We looked at activity levels, step count, rumination and eating times, lying times, and we tended to find that lying times were the, were the ones that were showing us the most interesting things, as well as step count. So for example, with step count, we found that step count for individual cows was correlated with behaviours like positively occupied, so the animals are enjoying what they're doing, they're occupied, whether that be rooting about and feed indoors or outdoors, and it was correlated with behaviours like happiness and contentedness and relaxed. So it's starting to show us that it could be possible to use sensor data that's automatically collected to try and understand a bit more about positive welfare and how happy that animal actually is. The sensor data showed for us that there was less of a range of lying times for animals that are at pasture. This could be because when animals are indoors, they might want to lie down but are choosing not to because things like stocking density and where they are and the pecking order in the herd can have a big impact. For example, if you're a cow who's fairly low down in the pecking order and the only empty cubicle is next to a really high ranking cow, it's likely that even if you want to lie down, you might not. Whereas if you're outdoors, you can choose to lie down as far away as you want from everybody else, but you're still getting to do those same behaviours at the same time. So that's where thinking about the basics like stocking density and how, how much space these cows have can really play a part in how happy they are. Although this was a feasibility study and the results are still being explored, Holly and Laura do have some useful outcomes from the project for farmers, which they can start thinking about and implementing on their farms. Some of the things we would like to highlight coming from this project are some of the back to basic things. Things like curb height, cubicle width, cubicle um, length, lunge space, and also things like loafing space. So you really want to think about are your cows able to behave similarly all at the same time. So thinking about lying comfort, stocking rate, stocking density, just having a look at your herd and seeing, are they all lying or are they all, are they all standing at the same time? A way to check how comfortable your cubicles are is to do a drop knee test. So just drop to your knees on your cubicle surface. And if it hurts you, it's more than likely going to hurt a 700 kilo cow. 
One of the other behaviours that you can look for in your shed, which again is a really easy way of understanding how comfortable are your cubicles and how comfortable are your cows, is to look for what's called perching. So how many of your cows are standing with their front feet on the bed and their back feet off the bed? So you can see this cow, she's just gotten up, she is perching. If you see excessive perching, so animals standing half in, half out their cubicles, it could be, um, it could be an example of poor cubicle comfort, things like there's a very high step height into your cubicle or your cubicle surface just isn't comfy, large enough, wide enough. So another really important reason to look at perching is that it can lead to really high levels of lameness in the back feet. So if you get a lot of animals perching for a long time instead of lying down, it can lead to lameness and obviously if they're not lying down, they're not comfortable, they're not making as much milk. The project also highlighted the importance of some of the basics on farms. So thinking about things like cow comfort, so what is your lunge space like, your cubicle comfort, thinking about that mattress, thinking about things like step height, how comfortable is it for your cows to go up and down into that cubicle. And one of the really interesting things that we found was actually the impact that the stock person can have on the cow's behaviour. We visited a great farm, um, really nice wide passageways, lovely cubicles, but they had a very, very noisy stock person. And this had a real impact on the animal's behaviour. We found that animals were a lot more skittish, so they ran away from us more, they were less relaxed, less content, showed more frustration, compared to those farms where the stock person worked very quietly, where the animals tended to be a lot more relaxed. So something as simple as thinking about how you are interacting with your animals can make a big difference to their welfare and their behaviour. Farming engagement was really high throughout the project. We found that farmers were genuinely enthused about trying to understand how happy were their cows on farm. And throughout the project we ran workshops um, in Scotland, England and in Wales and again found that the engagement was really high. People generally want to know how can they make their animals happier, how can they use technology that they already have to improve the animal welfare on farm. It's, it's really nice to have a potential way to show that the animals on your farm are happy and what you're doing is working well for them. So we tended to find farmers were looking for things that they could change on farm or things that they could bring in in order to make their animals happier. During the workshops with farmers we had a lot of discussions on what happens if your house 365, if pasture access just isn't possible for your farm? And although we are showing that animals tended to show more positive behaviours at pasture, it doesn't mean that animals housed are unhappy. The project is really about trying to explore what can you do to give those animals the best life and to make them as happy as possible. So it's starting to go back to basics and look at things indoors like your cow comfort, your mattress quality or your bedding quality, your step height, uh, your cubicle width and lunge size and even thinking about things like feed space and stocking density. All of these can have a big impact on your animal's happiness. For us, when the, the key thing that came out of the Dairy Sensors project and why we care about cow welfare and cow happiness is because a happy cow is a healthy cow is a productive cow and that's why it's really important for you to think about this on your farm. Although this project has now ended, it's not the end for the research which will continue through another project. The Dairy Sensor's findings will be expanded as part of the Strength in Places funded digital dairy chain project going forward. We're going to look to work with more processors, so working with First Milk again, but also Arla and Lactalis, reaching that wider farmer network and trying to work with more different farmers. So we're going to look to see whether we can understand variation in welfare, looking at things like large farms versus small, robots versus um, conventional milking, and starting to look at how different extremes um, impact on their welfare, so an exceptional farm versus a UK average and trying to look at how this can be reflected in the, the animal welfare and the data that we are getting back off the sensors and off the QBA. If you're interested in being involved in the project or you'd like to know more about it, you can get in touch with the Digital Dairy Chain project and us on the Dairy Centre email below. We're here at Oatridge, so welcome to the, the vet update for November. First off, what are we not seeing at the moment? Often at this time of year, farmers are thinking about fluke. We've been ingrained to worry about liver fluke because we generally think that we're a wet country and liver fluke is always an issue. Well, this year, the testing so far has suggested that liver fluke has not been a problem to date. So please don't just treat for liver fluke like you would by the calendar. 
make sure that you do some diagnostic testing to see whether your animals need treated for fluke or not. So that applies to both cattle and to sheep. So a really good way of doing this is to blood sample either this year's lambs or this year's calves about three weeks after housing for the, for the cattle to see if they've got evidence of antibodies to liver fluke because if they don't have any antibodies, that means that they've not been exposed to liver fluke and they don't need to treat it. And so that could save you money and save us using a dose when we don't need it. So if lambs aren't thin because of fluke, then what is pulling them down? We're, we're getting lots of reports of, of thin lambs, lambs that we can't get finished. And investigations have often found that some of these have got a really high worm burden or they've got problems with trace element deficiencies. So if you've got thin lambs that you're needing to get away, then getting some dung samples from them to get faecal egg counts done is a good idea to see if worming treatment is necessary. And if worming treatment is necessary, it's really a good idea to follow up with faecal samples after dosing to see whether the worming treatment that you've given has been effective. In order to tell whether there's a trace element deficiency or not, then the vet can come out to get blood samples from your lambs to see if they're deficient in copper, cobalt or selenium. We've had lots of issues with cobalt and selenium deficiency, but you don't want to give supplements or boluses for these things if they don't need it. So it's best to get the blood samples taken to assess what the current levels are to see if supplementation is needed, which will help to get them finished. If you're trying to decide whether trace elements are needed, then blood sampling is the way to find that out. So we can get the vet out to get blood samples from your lambs to test for copper, cobalt and selenium. In the last month or so, we've seen lots of lambs that have been deficient in selenium and in cobalt. We can't just presume though that that's the issue. And so it's best to get the blood samples taken so that we can decide which supplement is needed and, and treat appropriately. A couple of months ago, Ian warned us that, that lungworm could be an issue this year and it certainly has been an issue in, in recent months. So September, October, a lot of cases of, of coughing in calves at grass and sometimes even in older cattle has been due to lungworm. So I'm worried that there could be a lot of calves that have got damaged lungs as they're being, being housed. So if you've had coughing calves and they've not been treated for worms, speak to your vet to find out if lungworm could have been the issue because perhaps treating them for worms might be necessary to make sure that they're not carrying that burden over the winter. So a lot of spring calving cows are being, being housed just now and, and now's a perfect time to, to check them over. So it's a great idea to make sure that they're, they're scanned to see if they're pregnant or not. Any cattle that are not pregnant, we should be really thinking about whether they should be being kept in the herd or not. Can you afford this year to be keeping these empty cows over the winter and the associated costs with, with feeding them and, and housing them over the winter time? In addition to, to checking whether they're in calf or not, it's a really good opportunity to body condition score these cattle and sort them. So if you, you have lean group, if you have a, a, a group that are in, in decent condition and perhaps groups that are over fat, for spring calving cows, now is the time to think about how we can alter their condition score so that they're in the right condition score for, for calving. Once it gets to calving time, if the cows are in too fit condition, that can lead to calving difficulties. Equally, if they're too thin, then they might not have enough energy for calving, at, uh, so they can get difficulties with that as well. So if we can assess their condition now and feed them accordingly, feed them either to take account that they, they can lose some condition or give them some more if they're, if they're needing it. This is critical to make sure that, that the condition is, is right at the point of calving.